It's time to start setting up another rifle. Well, actually two of them. The FN Supreme with the commercial M98 miles of action and this Remington made 1903 A3 Springfield. But today we're just going to talk about the FN and where we're going with this one. And this is going to be my southern semi-scary game rifle as opposed to an African dangerous game rifle. Okay, for the FN. My first thoughts when I saw this rifle was African dangerous game rifle. I don't know why. Maybe it's just, you know, the Mauser control feed action on it. I, I don't know. It's definitely not the chambering because this is chambered in 30 out 6 rather than, you know, 375 H&H or something like that. But that, that was just my first thoughts on this rifle. Just, man, I can't tell you why. And I have need of a good brush gun right now. I was, I got a Winchester Model 94 chambered in 3030. That was my brush gun for deer hunting. And that's still as fine a brush gun as there ever was for deer hunting. The problem is my eyes aren't what they used to be. And I talked about this before, but the last time I carried that rifle out, especially in low light, I had a tough time seeing the sights on that thing. So I need something with the scope on it and I need something for brush. And we don't have dangerous game here in the Southern US, but we do have what I like to call semi-scary game. <laughs> kind of like an opossum. <laughs> you ever trapped one of those and start hissing at y'all mean like? <laughs> well, it's scary for a second. <laughs> But then it just rolls over and plays dead, and it's, you know, it's all good. But <laughs> for a second, when you jump one in the bushes, it will scare you. <laughs> but seriously, we do have some black bears running around. So if I wanted to go not very far from here at all, up into the mountains, I could hunt black bear. We have some really big boar hogs running around here in the swamps and stuff, and where I hunt at. So we do have some game here that it will get your attention. And when, when you're in the you know, thick mountain laurel or if you're in you know, thick vegetation in some swamp, you're talking short ranges. Good brush gun. And again, I, I need a good brush gun for deer hunting at the same time or I can certainly use one. Well, that kind of fits in with the whole African big you know, dangerous game rifles. They were set up primarily for, you know, close range brush. They just used a lot bigger bullets than I need. So for the FN, I want to set this rifle up with that in mind, an African dangerous game rifle. I just want that in mind. So I'm setting it up along those lines and it just, it fits with this rifle for me, for my eye. And it's going to make an excellent brush gun for, you know, actual what I do around here hunting. So this is going to be my semi-scary game rifle. <laughs> now, let's talk about the specifics on this rifle because it's going to be a little while before we get started on this because we got a lot of decisions to make here. So the first decision on this rifle was the refinishing. And I, I'm not going to do that. I've pretty much already made that decision. And I'm going to go with linseed oil, like I said earlier. To me, that just fits with this rifle. That's as traditional as you get. It's easy to, if you get a scratch in linseed oil, you can just sand out the scratch and refinish that one spot. So you don't have to strip the whole rifle down. There's a lot of advantages to it. And again, it just the looks and feel of linseed oil. I mean, so I'm going to go that route. And... I'm going to recut the checkering. Okay, someone's already refinished this rifle. And I want to point out, you know, right now, someone had mentioned in the comments before when I talked about refinishing this. They said I would destroy the value of it. What well, this rifle was pristine, you know, original condition, they're right. This 1903 A3 Springfield, somebody sporterized this. 
So instead of this being a $1,000 plus rifle in pristine original, you know, military configuration, this is a $299 rifle. That's the difference it can make on when you start changing things and modifying stuff from its original condition. This one's already been refinished. Okay, so I'm not going to hurt the value of this rifle. And if anything on this one, I should enhance the value of it. And I think this is actually going to be nicer when, I fin when I'm finished than it is now. And checkering, okay, this being my semi-dangerous game rifle, checkering actually serves a function. It's not just decorative. Checkering helps ensure you have a firm grip on the rifle, that it's not slipping. Okay, well, diamonds, the diamond patterns you see, those diamonds form sharp points, and that's what gives you your texture. Well, whoever refinished this, they sanded down the diamonds, and they're not sharp points anymore. Okay, so it's not nearly as functional as it will be when I redo the checkering. So it's I'm not doing that for appearance, I'm doing it for functionality. And for that, I've already ordered some checkering tools. This is, I've never done checkering. So I went ahead and ordered some tools. It's something I've always wanted to do. You know, it's, it's an art unto itself. But I, I have no interest in getting into carving or any of the decorative features. But I want to do it, be able to restore checkering on a rifle or add checkering to a rifle. The next thing, I really don't know what I'm going to do on this one, the butt plate. All right, someone took the original butt plate off of this rifle and they put a recoil pad on. Can't say I blame them, it's in 30 out 6. <laughs> recoil pads are always nice on an out 6. But the problem is, well, we've got a couple problems. This wasn't fitted very well when they put it on. And I don't think it was factory. I'm pretty sure someone added it. And looking at it right now, the way it's on here, actually, I could probably, it appears as though it's slid to one side. So I might actually be able to loosen the screws and get it back on center. And, you know, it might be fitted a lot better than I thought. Let's put it that way. It just might be out of place a little bit. But, Right now, the length of pull on this rifle is too long. With a brush gun, you want something that you can throw up and you're on target. When your length of pull starts getting too long, the distance from the trigger to your, you know, the end of the rifle, the butt. If I had on a heavy coat, when I throw this up, this corner is going to start grabbing. And that's where we're at right now with this. If they, sh it, this is getting tricky here. Usually when a recoil pad is added, whoever adds it, whatever gunsmith, individual, they'll actually cut wood off the end of the stock. That way, you know, to get the length of pull correct for whoever. Um, and a lot of times, especially with the older rifles, the butt of the rifle would have a curve in it, so if they put a recoil pad on it, they'd want a flat surface, so they would, you know, chop it off, slap on the recoil pad. I don't know that this one was cut down. So if I went back to the original butt plate, it might fit, it might not. In other words, I, I might order a new butt plate for it and it might work, it might not, who knows. And I could cut it down. I, I could trim the butt plate to fit, especially if it's plastic. That would be real easy. I'm not sure the specific year of this rifle, if it came with a plastic or, or a metal butt plate. Either way, I could fit it. And the advantage to the butt plate is you don't have rubber here. Like what I was saying about, you know, this corner grabbing on your jacket or whatever. Well, rubber wants to grab too. Whereas if it's just a butt plate fitted, you know, correctly to the wood, you know, it's just going to, even if you hit with the corner on a jacket or coat, it's still going to just slide right in place. And that pre-64 Winchester reminded me of that. I 
kind of gotten used to shooting everything with recoil pads lately and it didn't have a recoil pad. It was really nice shouldering that rifle. And it, again, it reminded me of all that. So I don't know if I'm going back with the recoil pad. I don't know if I'm going to try to find the original butt plate. And if I do go back with the recoil pad, I don't know exactly what but I do love the look of these vintage Patmire um, recoil pads. And matter of fact, both these rifles have identical recoil pads on them. Anyway, that's the decision we got to make here. And that's a tough choice to make. At the bench, I love the recoil pad. In the field, being this is 30 out 6, and it's not a 375 H and H, the original butt plate would be nice on here. So. Yeah, that's, well, it's one of the decisions we're going to need to make, you know, over the next month or so. And that's, we're not in a rush on some of these decisions because we are going to be refinishing it. And, but it's something to figure out. Right, the next thing is the bottom metal. Okay, originally this rifle, it's got a hinged floor plate. All right, so it's got, or had the latch on here, and, you know, you would pull the latch and then the floor plate would swing open. Well, at some point, apparently the latch broke or is missing or something. I, I really don't know what happened to it, but the latch is missing and someone soldered the hinged butt plate closed. All right, so there's no opening this one. Now it could probably be fixed. It's just tacked in place. And you know, I could probably come up with something for a hinge fitted in there, round up the springs and all that stuff, but it's probably going to be easier just to find another, the whole floor plate. And I checked eBay earlier and I, I just missed out on a really nice one that it would have been nice to have had on here. <laughs> it had a little more detail in, in it and so forth, so I think I'm just going to replace the bottom metal with something like that. But that's one of those things that, you know, I could be years waiting on the perfect floor plate for something this old. It functions as is. You know, we're going to leave it like this for now, but that's something I want to keep an eye out for. And that's what I meant by, you know, this stuff can be long and drawn out. <laughs> Next, we got to talk about a scope. We have a Williams peep sight on here now, aperture sight, and I would love to leave this on here. As a matter of fact, we're going to shoot this rifle just to see how accurate it is with the peep sight before I pull it off. I hate pulling it off, especially for what I'm going to use this rifle for. But for my eyes, I'm better off with the scope. Just bottom line, it's just, the scope's going to help me. Otherwise, I, I would leave this. So I got to figure out what scope to go with. And that's a tough call. I mean, it's, it's a struggle with scopes. Okay, and we're getting into some sensitive stuff here. But basically, there's a lot of gun snobs out there. I mean, it's, that's bottom line. And truthfully, I probably am one myself at times. <laughs> Okay, so let, let, let's talk about gun snobs. Gun snobs are the people that, that they only equate quality with money. It's expensive, so therefore it's better. That's the end of the discussion. What you had didn't cost as much as what I have, so therefore what you have is inferior. That's a gun snob. All right. Now, at the same time, with that said, a lot, oftentimes... It is true. Oftentimes when you pay more for something, it is better. Not always, but oftentimes it is. And for me personally, I think a good example of this, if we were going hunting and you showed up with the 275 Rigby, I'm an actual Rigby rifle chambered in 275 Rigby, which is sub miles. But those are extremely expensive rifles. I mean, we're talking some high dollar rifles there. What to me, if you have a Rigby rifle, you're not a gun snob. You just have really 
darn good taste in rifles and more money than I have. <laughs> That's not being a snob. Okay, I can appreciate quality anything. I, I really do appreciate quality, and if it costs more, it costs more. Okay, at the same time, though, it's just because it, something costs more, it's not necessarily better. All right, well, this is especially true as far as attitudes when we're talking about scopes. So many people think, okay, your scope should cost twice as much as your rifle. Well, obviously, those people have never owned a Rigby rifle, have they? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure my house costs twice as much as a Rigby rifle. <laughs> it was scopes, though. All right. And this is complicated here. For deer hunting, it's not the end of the world if your scope breaks and you're deer hunting. I'm just. Dangerous game. Okay, that could be bad. So, <laughs> if your scope broke and you were hunting dangerous game, that might not be good. Dangerous game rifles, people tend to use higher quality components. And those components oftentimes cost more. You know, you're getting something more dependable. All right, so my cheap scope that works on deer and I've never had a problem with, I might would want to upgrade a little bit if I were going dangerous game hunting. You know, it makes sense there, and that's not snobbery. We're, we're talking functionality. We're not talking about, you know, my stuff costs more than yours, so it looks better, or it is better. No, we're talking actual functionality here, and that's what I say. It's, it's a fine line between functionality and just snobbery. Okay, so scopes, that just seems to be the, the place where we all run into trying to figure out where that line's at. <laughs> so I need to pick a quality scope for this one. At the same time, my semi-scary game, <laughs> I don't need to go spending, you know, a lots and lots of money. I am on a budget, like so many of you. And for those of you that, if you had the money to afford the nicest, highest quality scope out there and rifle set up, get it. I mean, that's not snobbery. That's just, you're looking for quality and I get that. Not all of us have the money to spend on that. I mean, just bottom line is that our money would serve us better in other places. Okay, so that's a tough call for me on the scope. Uh, and that's something, you know, I'm thinking like a one by six. I'm thinking that would be perfect for this rifle and what I'm wanting to do with it. I have no idea what scope to go with. Though. So I'm gonna have to do some research on that and I'm gonna, you know, have to, you know, kind of balance things out here. You know, I do want something quality, something really stout, um, a good value. I think that's the best way to put it. But I can't be breaking the bank on this either. <laughs> and no, I am not paying twice as much for a scope as I did the rifle. That ain't happening. It hurt me just to pay as much for the scope as I did the rifle. <laughs> but anyway, that's just something, you know, I'm just going to have to figure out over the next month or so. All right, betting the stock. That's another decision to make. This barrel's not free floated and the, you know, it's not bedded, the action's not bedded and the barrel's not bedded to the stock. I'm not going to worry about trying to free float this barrel. Again, this is going to be a brush gun and I'm more worried about this being tougher than I am, you know, precision, bench rest, free floated barrel accuracy. And the problem you run into with the free floated barrel, you, you get generally get better accuracy or so. It's generally a lot easier to set up a rifle that has a free floated barrel. I'm not going to say it's more accurate than a rifle 
where the stock's bedded for the length of the barrel and the action. I mean, there's a lot of rifles out there that are absolute tack drivers where, you know, the entire stock's bedded. But it's, you can run into more problems with that. Like, it's easier to get a free-floated barrel to shoot accurately. That's the only way I know to put it. The downside is now you've got a channel running from, you know, here to here. Well, that's places for debris, twigs, leaves, and all that stuff to fall down in between your barrel and your stock. And if you're in really thick stuff like I go through sometimes, especially in some of these swamps, you get to you know, plowing through some of those vines and vegetation, you get limbs, you know, that they can actually get in between the forearm and the barrel and, you know, get pulled in there pretty tight. So for a true brush gun, something really rugged, I prefer that the stock be bedded, you know, the entire length of the barrel. This one's already a really tight fit. So I, I, I don't know that I would gain anything by doing that. I guess we're just going to have to shoot this one and see where it's at and then make a decision on that. If, how much accuracy do you need out of a brush gun? So that's just a decision we're going to have to make later on. Well, as you can see, we've got a lot of decisions to make here and we got stuff to order and that's what I meant by this is going to be long and drawn out. It's, there's a lot to setting up a rifle, especially when you're getting this deep into it. Well, that's why I wanted to go ahead and do today's video. I'm going to be fishing for a couple more weeks, and I, I still haven't been. I'm hoping to go this afternoon. I'm waiting on some bad weather to pass by. But while I'm fishing, you know, I can go ahead and be scratching my head on some of this stuff, ordering things and getting feedback from all of you. Because that's that's part of the fun, and you know, I'm really hoping to get some feedback on all of this. And just to add to that, I started a Tom River Simple Living Facebook group. I've got a channel page on Facebook, but I started a separate group just to make it easier for y'all to post pictures and so forth. And I've already, even with the page, I, I haven't announced any of this because truthfully I'm just setting it up and figuring that stuff out myself. <laughs> I'm not a Facebook fan, we'll put it that way. I'm as much a Facebook fan as they are a gun fan. How about that? <laughs> but that is a way for y'all to share pictures and I've already gotten some really good pictures on the Facebook page or sent to me through Messenger through that page that I thought it would be nice if I had a place where y'all could share pictures and we could communicate that, you know, we're so limited in the comments section on YouTube. All right, so that just gives us different options there. And I'm looking forward to hearing feedback from y'all on this. So we'll be making some decisions over the next month while I'm fishing and then about the time the fishing's over in two or three weeks or so, then, you know, we'll be ready to jump into this. And the next video, not, maybe not the next one, depends on how the fishing goes, but we're gonna do the video real soon on the 1903 Springfield because we've got a lot of decisions to make on it also in between now and, you know, when fishing ends. I've got, we've, same thing, so. <laughs> But I, I think that one's going to be interesting also. And this one, I, I'm thinking just set it up as just a straight classic American sporting rifle. I mean, that's, that's what a 1903 Springfield is. Always has been. I, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give the video a thumbs up. If you didn't enjoy it, give the video a thumbs up. Let YouTube know you enjoy hunting and shooting videos. And if you want to see where we end up on any of this, hit the subscribe button and notification bell. God bless and have a good day.